why I don't really have an issue with much of anything Luke Fickle said at his press conference. You are Locked On Badgers, your daily podcast on the Wisconsin Badgers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is going on, Badger fans? Welcome to Locked On Badgers, your team every single day. Thank you so, so much for tuning in. As always, appreciate you. Today's episode, we're talking about beating Nebraska, who the next offense coordinator should be, and why I'm not that stressed about what Luke Fickle said at his press conference. First, today's episode brought to you by FanDuel. Uh, this season, right now, new customers bet $5 to get started with $150 in bonus bets. If you bet your first $5 bet, visit FanDuel.com to get started. Uh, let's bring Curtis in. Uh, always good to get Curtis on the show. I want to start here, man, because there's been a lot of talk. Um, Badgers media, Badgers social media, Badgers fan pages about Luke Fickle, the press conference following the dismissal of Phil Longo. A lot of people are a little frustrated with not the greatest look. Maybe looked a little disorganized, a little salty, cutting people off. I'm just going to come on and say it. I don't really care about – I'm not stressed about anything he really said at the press conference. I expect him to be upset. The team isn't playing well. He just had to fire a head coach. And something we talked about before the show, and that I agree with, he's also a human, man. Like, he's not going to be in his best spot after losing that game to Oregon, then firing Phil Longo, and then standing up there answering questions. I'm just not that stressed about it because I don't think much of what comes out of press conferences ever is that big a deal. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's definitely not the look you want to present, right? I mean, obviously, press conferences, they're a way to kind of a, a window into the program, especially when you don't get a lot of access to see practices or things like that. You don't really get to see kind of the inner workings of a program. College is a lot different than the NFL in the sense that a lot of times it's more guarded. Uh, the NFL is a lot more open. It's more of a media product, whereas college traditionally, um, you know, hasn't been. It's been, you know, the the inner workings of a, of a, a collegiate institution and things like that, and it's been a little bit more guarded traditionally i think with the crossover of nil kind of moving into more of the college space of becoming more professional you know i can understand a little bit of the consternation from a press corps saying hey look like what's the deal why are these things happening what are we trying to do what are you thinking here why'd you do this why'd you do this um but you know fickle's a college coach and he's been a college coach for 20 30 years when none of this was how it went down right um and i think that obviously he's frustrated he didn't want to have to fire phil longo two years into his career that's not why you hire phil long you don't hire him so that you have to fire him in two years so obviously that didn't work i know he's not happy about that i know the higher ups you know they're probably not happy about that either i don't think fickle's really in any threat of losing his job uh but it's definitely something that you gotta fix right and so um coming into a press conference you're upset you're emotional that game was close it was within our grasp a couple things go our way maybe the, the, the score has changed so you're going to be frustrated and um, right now, I know for the team, all they want to do is focus on Nebraska. You know, what happened, happened, and you got to move forward. But that's not where the press is at. You know, that's not the news. That's not the scoop. And so they're going to continue to push on uh, what happened with with Longo. So um, that frustration to me, it, it, it makes sense. Do I think he could have handled it better? It, you know, if I was Patrick Herb or, you know, whoever, maybe I would have been like, hey, man, look, I know you want to talk to Nebraska, but this is all they're going to ask about. Like, make sure you're on point with your answers. I, I probably would, but, you know, at the end of the day, I, I don't put a lot into it, um, especially because, you know, the big the big thing that came up, oh, well, we don't know who cares who's going to be calling plays. There is no play caller. We have all play call, like all that stuff. Like it was clear when you listened to the players yesterday that they knew the plan from the start, who the who the um, play callers were going to be and what their plan for Nebraska was. So I don't look at it as any internal issues. I just think it's, you know, just kind of a, a rough presser. Yeah, and I'll say this. I, I I do want to agree with your point here that it wasn't the best look. Uh, this is not for me to come up here and say that's exactly how I, I think Luke Fickle should have answered all those questions or that, listen, being a head coach, part of your job responsibility, it's listed in the job description, is working with the media. It's talking to the media. It's part of doing press conferences. Like, it's not the best look. I think my bigger point is I was surprised by the amount of blowback because to me, that press conference isn't the big story. It's he needs to fire, find an OC. He needs to prepare for Nebraska. He's still got to win one more game to get to a bowl game. Who's the quarterback? Like, there's bigger issues, and it felt like the uh, reaction to, well, he's a little he's, – he's salty in that he didn't answer that great. I was like, okay, you're right. He didn't. I don't really care, though. <laughs> like, I also don't really care that much about it. Um, there was one moment in his press conference I didn't love where he questioned – I think it was uh, Colton asking about the defense line rotation, and he had asked him, well, do you have the numbers? Like that felt like a bit of a gotcha moment. I don't want my head coach getting into like a, a back and forth necessarily. 
But again, for the most part, I just don't really care about the press conference, good or bad. If you went out there and he hit a home run at the press conference, it still doesn't change any of the actual big problems with this team is where I'm at. That's what I'm curious about. That's what I'm worried about. And let's let's talk to quarterbacks. Like, let's speak on quarterbacks because that's the next thing. I talked about that yesterday. Uh, What was your take when you saw uh, Braden Locke, starting quarterback for Nebraska, um, good or bad? What are your thoughts there? Yeah, I mean, um, well, and I'll get to that in a second. I just want to say one thing on the on the press conference again. You know, I think um, there's a level to which, and this sort of ties into the quarterback conversation. I think that I, I think back on the um, the press conference that Mike Gundy had, however many years ago, where you know he starts railing off at the media like, "Hey, don't don't write at me. Come at me. I'm a man. I'm 40. Don't write about a player who he has to do the things to do, and then he goes out and does those things. Like, don't go after him." You know, part of me wonders. Luke Fickle is is very much a player's coach, and he cares a lot about his 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 team and, and and the players and making sure they're in position to be successful, not just on the field, but off the field as well. And I think there's an element of, you know, hey, like, come after me. Like, if, if someone's going to be the bad guy in this situation, I'll be the bad guy. I'll have the shitty press conference. Oh, sorry for using a bad word, but I have the bad press conference. And, um, you know, uh, I, I think there is some element of that. But, but you know, kind of going into the quarterback conversation, I think this sort of ties into that because I do think the reality is it, it, with – it never being in doubt that that lock is the starter for Saturday, then one of two things is is true in my eyes. One, uh, it's very clear that lock, unfortunately or fortunately, gives us the best opportunity to win. That Mabry isn't performing; he hasn't picked up what he needs to pick up. He can't execute the offense properly. And you know, we have you know heard some things from you know Brian Smith and things like that when he was coming in. You know, he throws the ball kind of hard, he's not always accurate, he doesn't always make the right reads. Sometimes he locks on the receivers. So there's a chance that he's not there yet. And it is significantly more detrimental. I mean, again, I know fans want to see, hey, what can the backup give us? We're not looking great with a starter. What can the backup give us? It could be significantly worse than what it is right now. Mm-hmm. Significantly worse. You put a guy and it's not even about breaking Mabry's conference. You put a guy uh, confidence. You put a guy in there that's not ready. That that changes the entire dynamic of the football game. Like we could go from you know maybe being able to execute plays or move the ball efficiently to all of a sudden now we got multiple three and outs. He's in his head. It's a hostile environment away. We could tank the game real fast if you're not careful. So you know I caution people to that. But then my other thought is, and this let's work on that one. Let me let me interject. And then I want to you. I think one of the things that people are also maybe glossing over a tiny bit. You're not going to change out your offensive coordinator and then go into a road game where you need to win a game that they also need for a bowl opportunity and start a freshman quarterback for his first ever start in a road environment with a brand new offensive coordinator. You're just you're just not going to do that. I know people say, well, what that's a great opportunity to start the young guy. I'm like, no, that's a great opportunity that they're just going to go with the experienced guy. Yeah. I mean, you you just did one of the biggest changes you could possibly do to your team. You got to control one variable at a time. You can't change everything. You start changing everything, then all of a sudden it, it's a completely different team. I know some Badger fans would be like, great, that means our offense is better. Like, let's be real here for a second, okay? We just played Oregon, the number one team in the country, top 10 defense. We played Penn State a couple weeks ago. They're like a number five defense in the country. We played Iowa. They always have a really good defense. Like, it takes a really good offense to look good against those defenses. Ohio State looked terrible for half of the game versus the team we just played, right? So to sit here and act like, oh, these are so bad, we can't score anything. We just played the number one team in the country. We have never in the history of my fandom as a Wisconsin fan been good on offense against the number one team in the country, save for one time, which is when we obviously uh, beat Ohio State uh, that one year. So, um, you know, I, I think that it's kind of, you know, short-sighted and ignorant to just think that, oh, locks the source of all our problems, our offense isn't good, and, you know, it's just not going to work on anybody. Like, that's absolutely incorrect. Rucker, or Nebraska is closer to Rutgers, who Lock put 42 on, than they are to any of the teams we just played. Um, now, going back to, I think, the other thing on Mabry is, I think the, and this might, I don't know how likely this is, but I would feel like it's probably more likely, is I think he probably has decided, hey, look, you know, I committed to Wisconsin to play for Phil Longo. Um, every interview you ever did with him, when you talk to his dad, all these things that I've seen from his recruiting visits, he was committed to Phil Longo, right? I mean, yeah. we, we gotta be, we gotta be honest with ourselves here. He likes Wisconsin. I think the family likes Wisconsin. Who doesn't like Wisconsin? Wisconsin's awesome. But he was going to go to UNC when Longo was there, and he didn't decide to change until he came to Wisconsin. And uh, it, you know, it just so happened that he had already visited there, and so kind of already knew the area. But um, he's committed to Phil Longo. He's made that clear from the start. I think I think his family has expressed you know something similar to that. That's the relationship that they have, and so quite frankly, I think he's going to I think he's going to leave. And and again, Luke Fickle being more of a player focused guy, I think is respecting. Hey man, if you're if you're if you really want to do this, I want what's best for you. We're not going to burn your red shirt on that because that's just not fair to the kid, right? And so I think that's probably 
uh, the other thing that might be at play here. Yeah, I, I talked about that on today's show or yesterday's show a little bit. I think that's a very real possibility. Nothing I've heard, but we we see it in college football at schools all across the country. You know, players deciding, making business decisions. Listen, that's college football now. It's business decisions on both ends. So we've definitely seen that. I want to write that out. We're going to take one quick break. We're going to come back, talk a little bit about Curtis turned me on to an offensive coordinator that I wasn't really tracking, and now I'm in love with the guy. I'm going to ask him who we should hire and who we should go after, ideally, for the next offensive coordinator spot for the Wisconsin Badgers. That's coming up next on Locked On Badgers. But first, a quick second for our friends of the show, new friends of the show over at Skylight. Listen, I've talked about it. Like Technology has advanced to the point where you don't need to have those old, static, dusty pictures up on the wall. Like They don't change. They're not dynamic. They're not eye-catchers. Now you can get a skylight frame, get the pictures you want, the digital pictures you want. It's a great gift. Holiday season's coming up. Heck, forget the people. Maybe you just get a, a skylight frame with Camp Randall in it. So when you're on business trips, you go into the hotel, you put up your skylight frame, which is a digital frame. You can put it on the wall. Camp Randall can scroll through. You can put all your favorite badgers in there, whatever it is. Skylight's incredible. 10-inch uh, or 15-inch displays, depending on what size you want. Touch screen, satisfaction guarantee. They're so confident that you will love skylight. 120 day return, top rated brand, over a million happy customers, thousands of five star reviews. I'm one of those people. We've used this. Available over 30 countries, recommended by the Today Show, Forbes, and Ryan Ehrings. I mean, forget those other jokers. I recommend it because it's perfect. It's great. It's an excellent gift. We got one from my mom. Uh, so they have a digital frame of the family, the grandkids when they're traveling. And now, a special limited item offer for our listeners get $20 off your purchase of a skylight frame when you go to skylight.com slash college at skylight.com slash college get $20 off your purchase now at skylightframe.com slash college today's episode also brought to you by our incredible friends over at FanDuel again long-term partnership with the Lockdown Network for a reason they're great uh the biggest sports book that we we use the official sports book of the NFL the official sports book of the Lockdown Podcast Network futures parlays teaser spreads it's all there it's easy to use like super easy the layout is simple Payouts are quick. Technical support is incredible when you do need it. I use this product. Locked On uses this product. FanDuel.com right now. $5 bet gets you $150 in bonus bets guaranteed if you win. You're not going to beat that offer anywhere else. Go over to FanDuel.com. Spice up your sports week and always do responsibly. FanDuel.com, the official sports book of the Locked On Podcast Network, uh, the NFL. Make Never waste a hunch. Make FanDuel.com your first stop today. Okay. Let's jump back into this convo. Get uh, Curtis always grateful that Curtis on backups on the show. I'm gonna kick this over to you because I, I talked on yesterday's show a little bit about some people, some names that I'm interested in, who I think might be. You gave me a name that I'm on, I'm in love with right now. Who should the Badgers target at OC? Well, when you're thinking about the OC move, I think there's a number of factors that play here. I, you know, um, obviously, Fickle. It seems to be the common thought that Fickle's going to want to get a guy that he's familiar with, that understands what he wants to do as a program and, and things like that. And that could ultimately prove to be the right move. It does feel like the safe move. Um, and it feels like it could be the right move. You know, I think you mentioned Gino Gadulli today. Uh, that would be probably who I think is probably the number one target if I had to make a hot board right now for, for Fickle and probably the most likely. Like if I'm putting betting on betting odds on it, it's, you know, minus 150. That's, that's who our next OC is going to be. Uh, but – at the same time, you know, when I think about what Wisconsin wants to do, obviously we tried to bring in the air raid. And I'm not saying it didn't work. It, it didn't statistically and from a scoring perspective for the last two years. If we were to continue to build over 10 years, get four-star receivers, get four-star quarterbacks and sort of build long-term, maybe it could have worked, right? I'm not going to write it off as completely in, incapable. But we got to be somewhat realistic about what we're what we are as a program what we've been what we can attract and what we can do moving forward I do think we can elevate all those things but you want to look for an offense that fits into what Wisconsin is and so uh I think the, the guy you're referring to the one who I, I was looking at um was Brennan Marion um and I had heard his name in a couple different videos as a hot name you know coordinator and yeah, I've been paying attention to UNLV a little bit they got a really good squad this year uh, but, you know, go-go offense, some kind of creative thing. I don't, it sounds gimmicky. I don't really know what it is. Like, I'm not really feeling it until I actually looked into the man. Uh, and if anybody has the opportunity, there's a couple videos on YouTube, but I, I, I implore you to just go, go hear this man's story. I mean, it's phenomenal. He came from, he came from, you know, very, very, very rough upbringings, you know, made it to a junior college. That junior college almost shut down. He had to go and recruit a team as a player in order to play. Then he started, you know, he, then he uh, transferred to Tulsa, set a bunch of records. 
tried to go to the NFL, tore his ACL a bunch of times, but he was the one. He didn't have an agent. He was making his own calls, trying to make practice rosters. He ended up taking over a high school team um, in inner city Oakland that was 1-11, uh, had seven or eight guys at practice, was able to finally build a team, took them to the playoffs for the first time in like 20 years. And he just continued to do things like that over and over and over again in his career. I mean, this man is is, is really a phenomenal guy. Um, and uh, when he designed his go-go offense, you know, he he had played for Mike Norvell and um, uh, Gus Malzahn when they were running sort of that spread option look before uh, uh, Malzahn ended up taking over at Auburn. And, um, you know, he liked that system. He thought it worked well, but but he wanted to design an offense that stood the test of time and that's worked for forever. And so, you know, he had talked about going back to the annals of football lore, going all the way back to the beginning of college football and being like, what's been consistent? And the option has been a consistent offense that's worked for essentially forever. And uh, pretty much all, you know, Shanahan and these things, you know, they have different run motions and things like that. It's mm -hmm. all basically pre-snap option. And then the RPO is basically just option. The spread, how it was played over the last 20 years, is basically just been an option attack. So everything is basically option, even though words have changed and people think the option, they think, you know, Georgia Tech or the uh, military schools. Um, but his triple option run attack is based off of a shotgun spread formation. And then their goal is to be able to press the ball down the field when they can to wide open wide receivers for deep shots to keep the defense honest. And uh, there's different formations as to how they utilize this. They like to use uh, overloaded two backs to a side or, you know, overload formations where they have the entire offense on one side of the field, no one on the other, because it messes with defenses who are creatures of habit. I think back to the Iowa game. Our biggest problem in the Iowa game is that starting the beginning of the second quarter, Phil Parker just sat in cover two and stayed in it the entire rest of the game. He did not shift. Go back, watch the game. He literally just ran cover two the whole time, did nothing else. And what did we do? We lined up two by two and ran mesh, stick, Y cross, and four verts. That's it. Into cover two the whole rest of the game. We had no creativity. We had no looks designed to be cover two. We did nothing creative. Let's run Y, y cross into the deep middle where there's a safety sitting there. And, oh, look, Braden Lock goes nose pick. Who thought that was going to happen? Right? So it's just like – that lack of creativity and the simplicity of which Iowa beat our defense is, or beat our offense, is why that struggled. Now you go the next week, Iowa struggles versus a UCLA with uh, Eric Bieniemy utilizing unique looks, unique passing formations that takes them out of their simple defense. Right? That's what Brendan Marion does. He takes you out of that. You cannot be balanced when you play him because he'll play you in a way that unbalances formations and things like that. So that's what I really liked about him. Um, do I think we get him? Uh, I'm going to be honest. No, <laughs> because, uh, you know, I know yeah, I just I know. kind of ranted about him for a while. All uh, that build up you just gave yeah. everybody about how exciting yeah. it is. I don't, real, I don't... real exciting. I know I just wasted about five minutes of everybody's time. But, uh, I mean, the reality is um, he had played for miles on. He coached for Norvell already. Both of them are looking for OCs this year. My, my, my saving great, my hope is that, you know, Florida State won't let him hire a young up-and-comer at a lower-level school because, you know, it's Florida Oh, I lost you for a sec. Curtis, I'm, I don't have Curtis right now, but let, I do want to ping on something Curtis just said, and hopefully he can bop back in here. The idea of, of messing with the defense is eye discipline. If you go back to Paul Christ, that's something that he did all the time. Sorry, I lost you for a second there. So I just I wanted to ping actually on a point you made, though, with messing with the defense is eye, eye discipline. And if you go back to Paul Christ, and this isn't like a, we need to go back to the Paul Christ offense, but one of the reasons he used motion, right, was to do that, was to shift defenses, was to mess with their eye discipline, was to make them think, was to make them second guess things. Um, we haven't, even, even if it's not a, a Brendan Marion, like even if we don't go there, that some of the traits that you're describing with him is what I want from our new offensive coordinator. Somebody who's going to be creative, right? Somebody who's going to mesh into what we're doing. Somebody's not going to be so stubborn. Um, the other one, Marion, young, he, he's coached at Texas. Um, he's still hungry. He's had success at places without great resources. I mean, his I, offense, he feels he like designed his offense powerful. because when he took over, his first college job was Howard. That's where he designed his – really designed his offense. When he took over uh, as OC at Howard, they were 1-11. Howard was not even remotely close to the most athletic team in the SWAC at all. And so he's like, I need to be able to create an offense that's simple, that you can utilize what we have, and that – allows us to punch up, that we can play up against teams that are bigger, faster, stronger, and not only bigger, faster, stronger, but consistently bigger, faster, stronger. Let's think about that for a second. We're in a league now that has Ohio State, Michigan, Penn State, Oregon, USC at times, Nebraska mm -hmm. at times, right? Iowa. These are team, yeah, Iowa at times. These are teams that can ha build teams over time that are bigger, faster, stronger than us. And we're improving. We're getting better. I'm not saying that we're slouches ourselves, but we're not Ohio State, we're not Penn State, we're not Oregon. Like, it's going to take us a while to get to that level. 
And so you need a guy with an offense that's designed to beat teams better than us. It's that simple because we'll absolutely beat the teams we're better than. No doubt. I mean, not, we obviously can lose games, but like we'll beat the teams we're better than. And then if we can punch up, if we can get teams like that to play with their left hand, kind of like we had with Oregon last week, then we can we can easily punch up and potentially win a Big Ten championship if we're, you know, have a team that's that's all the way put together and, and ready to go. And if you find a quarterback, but that's for a different show. Um, coming <laughs> up, we, we're going to talk a little Nebraska really quick. I, I have a question. I talked about this a little bit. I do want to ask Curtis, what does he think can possibly change on the offense in one week with the new offensive coordinator and how he feels about Nebraska coming up? That's next, Locked On Badgers. First, a quick second for our friends of the show, returning friends of the show, over at Prize Picks. It's been a second since we all talk about how amazing Prize Picks is. They are awesome. Prize Picks is the best place to get real money sports action. Over 10 million members and billions of dollars in awarded winning winnings. Prize Picks has made daily fantasy sports accessible to all. You just pick more or less than at least two players for a shot to win up to 100 times your cash. Run your game all season long on Prize Picks. I use it because it's just simpler sometimes. Like I just want to go in and be able to pick more or less on a couple players, whether it's more or less on. Braylon Allen rushing yards, Brock Purdy passing yards. I don't have to do anything else. I'm not competing against some, not scammer out there, but some dude who's out there just running 10,000 simulations a day. I don't have time to do that. This is easier. It's why I use Price Picks. Price Picks is the only daily money fantasy platform with an insurance, injury insurance policy. So your lineup stay in play. Even if one of your guys gets injured, if your player leaves in the first half and doesn't return, Price Picks keeps your lineups live. Sign up today, get $50 instantly when you play $5. You only need to win to receive the $50 bonus. It's guaranteed. Um, just think Justin Jefferson, and if you'll get more than 83.5 yards, like it's as simple as that, more or less. That's all you have to do right now. Download the app today. Use code Locked On College to get 50%, $50 instantly after you play your first $5 lineup. That's Locked On College to get $50 instantly after you play your first $5 lineup. Price picks, run your game. Okay, let's talk Nebraska. Let's get Curtis on here, finish up this show. I want to leave with this question here because I, I talked about it yesterday, but I'm very curious in your take. And I haven't pinged you on this, so I don't actually know where you're at. How much of the off what what can change in one week with a new offensive coordinator? Um, probably less than we would like, but more than you think. Uh, I know that's kind of a catty answer, but I think about you know the one thing that 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 uh, has been mentioned this week, and I can't remember if it was Fickle who said it or who had mentioned it, but there's a probably a reality that we're going to do a little bit more huddling this week. That's a rather significant change considering we haven't huddled in now two years. Um, you know, obviously Wisconsin's been known for that type of play for forever, but you're, you've been running the same offense for two years. That's going to be a change. Um, so that's interesting. And if that's the case in my mind, then a lot of things can change because now, you know, you're discussing the play with the entire team right in front of you. You can get, a, you can do a lot more in terms of getting creative with what type of look you have, reminding players that maybe aren't familiar with every play in the book. Like, hey, this is what we're trying to do. This is what we need you to do on this play. Hey, we're going to come after you. We're looking for you to do this. We're looking for you guys to do X. So you can do a little bit more in that way. Um, I think you're going to see maybe a little bit more creativity. I kind of think of it like this. Watch our defense all season and then watch us in the Oregon game. Our defense almost played what I would say is a different style of defense, specifically in the front. Because all of a sudden now we're slanting, we're doing uh, um, different crosses, we're doing uh, different types of delay blitzes and things like that. Stuff that we had done a lot when you know Leonard was our coach. Uh, but we haven't done a lot recently. A lot of what we've been trying to do is just, hey, just beat your man, right? And that works when you're better than a team. It doesn't work when you're not. And mm -hmm. so, you know, the things that we were doing on defense, it, it worked phenomenally because I think we caught Oregon's offensive line off guard a lot of the game that they weren't really expecting us to, to fight in the way we did. Um, and so I kind of think of it like that with the offense. I think you're going to see slightly different looks, not entirely different. We'll still probably have hurry up. We'll still probably have mostly air raid style plays because that's what we have. And that's what we're, you know, been doing all season, good at it or not. That's what we know. So I think you're still going to see a lot of that, but you might see maybe some screens. I don't even know the last time we ran a screen. Maybe you see a screen or two. Maybe you see, um, some different end around looks. Maybe you see some different fakes, some different things like that, that, that are different than what we have done pattern breakers that we've done all season. Well, I, I think you're going to see, to your point, creativity over under 0.5, one, even 1 1.5 trick plays. And trick play, by definition, maybe a double reverse, a halfback pass, uh, some type of wildcat formation, you know, your receiver throw. I think you're going to see something like that this weekend. Yeah, I think I think it's going to be – it'll be interesting. To see. I mean, because, I, you know, it'll be interesting how it's set up. So we do know Guyton's calling – or um, Letton's calling the plays. So probably – Letton's been in the box all year from what I understand. So he'll probably be in the box – I, I do like having a coordinator in the box because he can see the field. Yeah. Um, that's the one thing I do like. And so he'll be 
calling a play and and then Guyton will be signaling it in. I remember in an interview, one of the first interviews, interviews with Guyton, one of the first things he talked about was being make being able to learn all the signals, learn all the offense, so that if he had to, he could call it. I don't think he was foreshadowing anything, but that was what his prerogative was when he got here. And so that's what I think you'll see. You'll see that kind of tandem. That's probably what they mean by tandem. But probably in terms of game planning, it'll be a cooperative effort like today and tomorrow to game plan it. Um, in terms of in the game, it'll probably be letting in and maybe, you know, with someone who can veto it or change the play or lock being able to call something at the line. That's probably more what you see. But in terms of the plan, I don't think it's any different than any other week's plan. It just changes who does what. Um, so, you know, uh, and that can galvanize a team. It can hurt a team. You know, the ironic thing was, and I, I don't want to read into this too much, but it is worth noting. Listen to the offensive players in their interviews yesterday. They they seemed excited about what was coming. They seemed excited about the plan they had. Um, you know, specifically CJ Williams seemed very excited about uh, the, the new strategy they were, they were coming up with. It sounds like they were finally getting on the same page with the quarterbacks, which is another question that I have no idea what all that was about. But, you know, you're running a air raid timing based system sort of offense and you're not ever meeting with the receivers. That's, you know, that, I, I, I don't know. That's an interesting thing to me. That was, that was an interesting <laughs> comment from TJ yeah. Williams for sure. And also Jake Brentford we talked about before the show, but Jake sounded pretty interesting. He had an interesting soundbite where he said, we're excited to show people what's different on Saturday. We're not going to get into it here. That's an interesting yeah. say. It's clear the messaging within the team is solid and coherent, right? So all the mumble jumble you heard in the press conference, that's not what's in the team room. The team room was on the same page. They were locked in. So I, I feel like as long as that's the case, like I'm cool with it. If, if we were to have these players interviews where they're like, oh, I don't know, you know, we, we really don't know who's calling the place. That's a big red flag. But, yeah. you know, but the, the fact that they all had the same answers, they were all consistent with it. And they were all, you know, hey, we had a plan. We're going to execute it. We're excited about it. I feel good in that way. Um, and then, you know, you, you, yeah, quick, quick thoughts on Nebraska to wrap this sure. up. Um, I know a team that is also kind of, in, I don't want to say disarray, but the like Nebraska of, Week three, week four is not Nebraska of right now, right? This is a team that is also kind of collapsing. Uh, I think there's some things we can explore here. We talked before the, the show a little bit about some of what you saw in Oregon, attacking the edges, running off tackle a little bit more, getting to the outside. I think it's going to work against Nebraska. Uh, what are your thoughts on Nebraska coming up this weekend, the road trip? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've, I've said my thoughts on Nebraska multiple times on this show already. I don't think they're good. I don't. I never thought they were good all season, even when they were ranked. They, 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 they've done nothing to demonstrate – being good. They have a freshman quarterback. Yeah, he he's a phenom, but he's kind of injured right now. I don't know where his headspace is at. He's got a new OC too, so he's doing some some things too. And that didn't necessarily fix their problems overnight when they played USC. Um, I do think Hogelson's a better OC than what they had, so I think that they'll improve. Um, but nothing they've done all season has demonstrated their ability to me that they're a competent team. I mean, and, and that's where I, I look at things like when we were right before Rutgers, you know, and I called, we're going to blow this team out. I have zero qualms about saying that, right? And that's what happened. Why did I do that? Because I watched the Nebraska Rutgers game and Nebraska is slow. They're slow everywhere. They have one fast player. I think it's number 17 on their offense. They have a couple of guys in the secondary that aren't bad. Other than that, they're slow. Their D line is slow. Their linebackers are slow. Their safeties are slow. They're a slow team. You know, they're like old Wisconsin. They're just not fast, right? Their offense, same way. And their run game is non-existent. So, you know, the, the thing that that I'm I worry about going into a game like this is it's on the road. Where's Braden Locke's head at? What are we doing on offense? Because I have absolutely no idea what we're doing on offense. I do like that the players feel confident. Outside of that, it's tough to say. So it's tough. To, that's that's a handicap. I don't know. But if we were looking at that three-week stretch where we were dominating teams, Nebraska would be another team we beat 40 to 10. Like, I, And I would have zero issue saying that then. When we were hot, I'm co I'm confident we'd crush this team. People are saying, well, we we struggled against Penn State, and then we went into Iowa and got ran over. Iowa knows what it is. Iowa's a good team. They have a dope walker running back. Like, they know what they're doing. Nebraska does not have any of that at all. So, I, you know, I, I don't look at them like a team that, like, oh, they're going to put up 42 on us. They haven't, I think they scored 42 on UTEP. UTEP also got shredded by, you know, name a school. Like, it, it, that, that, that to me shows nothing. So, you know, I, I, I think um, it'll definitely be a challenge because it is a way. It is for a bowl. Um, uh, Rayola made a cardinal sin and guaranteed a win, so that that's interesting. All right. Um, but uh, but again, I I don't think Nebraska is on the level we are if we're playing our best game. If our defense shows up like it did last week, they're not going to score. You know, if if we're able to, uh, you know, if 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 we start slow but we stop them enough times, we'll eventually be able to get our run game going against a defense that I don't think is particularly great. 
Um, and I think Locke is good enough to hit one or two open guys, hit a Vinny Anthony, hit a TJ Williams on a cross, or hit a Will Pauling, or I don't even know if Will Pauling's playing. That dude is injured and then comes back every single week. So I have no idea what his deal is. Yeah. But I think we'll be able to hit enough things that we'll start to maybe put up some points, and I don't think they can match it. And so I do think it'll be a lower scoring game. Um, I think we I think we win because I think we outlast Nebraska. Um, and I think that mentally, um, as much as you know, last few weeks hurt, we have yet to quit which again, I've been saying all season, this team has no quit in them. And uh, Nebraska, man, this will be the what? Ninth, 10th, 11th game that they failed to go to a bowl on. I mean, it, that is in uh, their head. And so yeah, is Wisconsin. That, Wisconsin's in their head too. <laughs> we're both playing for that, right? I would I would love nothing more to go to Nebraska, um, continue potentially their bowl drought while keeping our bowl streak alive and then having some momentum coming back home against Minnesota. To me, like, I, worst case. You realize, you this is the Nebraska. third year in a row that we're five and five going into Nebraska. Is it? Yes. So 2022, remember Graham Mertz had that miraculous comeback. Yeah, you know, I do. Classic, yep. classic Graham Mertz, Mertz moment, you know, terrible start the game. And then all of a sudden comes roaring back, scores a touchdown with Skylar oh. Bell with like a minute left. And then you got last year, obviously with Tanner Mordecai, um, some great defensive plays and then stopping them in, in overtime. Uh, and so, you know, again, here we go again, five and five going into Nebraska and Minnesota and the year. <laughs> we got to break out of this cycle, man. We can't we can be five and five every year going to Nebraska and Minnesota. But anyway, he is Curtis Hall and great stuff as always. When you're done here, go check out Lockdown Big Ten, all the biggest conference stories over there. Curtis, man, as always, appreciate you jumping on. We will definitely talk next week if you're able to come in on Wisconsin. Thank you all so much.